church and I am super excited that we get today honor a ministry in our church for the last eight or nine weeks there has continued to be multiple needs multiple ministry taking place in our body and today I'm so grateful and thankful that we continue to have men and women step forward to be used by a holy and righteous God and so today we are going to bring forth some Stephen ministers that are coming in to serve this body now, you may be wondering, what is a Stephen minister? Now, these are people in our church who they go through a training so that they're able to give one-to-one, -one, so that's one-on-one -on -one care to people who are going through things. It could be something like you lost a job or a divorce or a family member, or whatever it may be that you're going through. They help you walk through that and love you through that process. Now, these are people who are passionate about showing the love of Jesus and caring for people. And so we are so happy to present these people to you. These are the ministers being commissioned today. Kirk Wallace, Heidi Clifton, Diana Gates, George Johnson, Don Wood. What a great day and a great opportunity to be able to honor men and women who are faithfully stepping forward to serve God. We pray with me as I pray over these. God, I thank you for men and women throughout this body who continually just rise to the occasion. And so what we know today is that we live in a, fallen, broken world, and there are needs all around us. And so, Lord, what I pray over each one of these being commissioned today is that your favor would rest with them, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would use them in ways that they would have never dreamed. Lord, they are saying today, they desire to be your hands, they desire to be your feet. Won't you use them to touch people, to reach people for the name of Jesus? Thank you so much, God, for inspiring my heart are watching individuals step forward. We do this because we love you and we praise you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Everybody in the house said, amen, amen, and amen. Hey, worship's about to get started in just a minute, but be sure and stay tuned. Because we have an incredible announcement coming up. Brandon, tell them the announcement. After, after the sermon. You gotta stick around. Tell, no, go ahead and tell them now. No, no, you gotta wait. We'll see you in just a bit. I tried. Hey, good morning, church. We're so glad that you have joined us this morning to worship. We're going to do this this morning as we start in worship today. We're just going to sing this prayer to him. Ask that he would turn our eyes to Jesus, that he would center our lives and who we are, everything we are, on everything that he is, because he is worthy of all our praise and honor and affection. He is risen. He is glorious. And when we fix our eyes and our lives on him, we will not be shaken. So let's do that this morning.
Church, let's take a moment this morning and reflect on the generous nature of our God. He was so generous to give us his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins so we could have life. He gives us his Holy Spirit that fills us, that guides us and directs us. Look around your homes right now. He gives you your family, your friends, a roof over your head. And this morning, as we gather together as his church, I'm reminded that he is generous to entrust us with ministry here at the fellowship, that he partners with us. He allows us to give of our time, our gifts, and our finances, all so that we can see more people reached and more people grow to be like him. It's why we do events like Vacation Bible School, or this year it's Virtual Vacation Bible School, where we are taking a trip around the world. It's going to be June 1st through the 4th. We have two opportunities, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. on YouTube Live, and we invite your families to be a part of this incredibly special event that is going to reach the most amount of people that we've ever been able to reach at one of our Vacation Bible Schools before because it's online. And this is a time for us to be generous to God, to be generous to our community around us, to invite, to text, to send messages to your friends to make sure that the most possible kiddos around our world can see virtual vacation Bible school and can hear the gospel message maybe for the first time. And so church this morning, as we prepare to give generously to God, we invite you to use this moment to give generously to God. You can visit us on our website or you can text the code to the bottom of your screen to give here at the Fellowship Church. So we invite you right now to stop and to pray with us that God would move through vacation Bible school, that he would save the lives and the souls of the children, maybe even the adults that are listening and that are watching and that God would continue to bless ministry at the Fellowship Church. Church, we thank you for your generosity. Now, will you pray with us? God, we are so in awe of who you are. We are in awe of your giving nature. God, we love your generosity. We love the ways that you have poured out blessing and gift upon us. God, we ask that you create hearts in us that are cheerful givers as well. 
hearts that are generous with our time, our gifts and our finances, specifically coming up with Vacation Bible School, with Virtual Vacation Bible School. God, fill our hearts with names of people that need to hear your gospel message and help us to be bold enough to invite those people. God, to make this Vacation Bible School the one that reaches the most amount of people. God, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the life that you give to it. We thank you that it is only through you that this church goes and runs. It is only through you that ministry is done because ministry is about the message of hope that is found in only you. So God, we thank you for your generosity. And this time we give what we have to you because you are a good God who is worthy of it. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Oh
peace In your presence we are free There's no better place to be There's no better place to be In your presence there is truth In your presence mountains move We forever run to you We forever run to you Jesus, we're here declaring that we need you. God, we believe that our freedom, our peace is found in you, is found in your presence. God, you've shown us over and over again that you can be trusted. And so, Lord, we base our lives on you, on who you are, because you're worthy. song we could ever sing and worthy of all the praise we could ever bring and worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we feel so Jesus and Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe with you. It's telling me holy. Come on, sing out.
Hello, church, and I am incredibly excited on what, for what's right in front of us. Vacation Bible School. Every year, it's obvious when Vacation Bible School is going to take place because our building looks so different every year. Well, this year, our building is still going to look different, and I can't wait for you to see it. Our Beyond Us initiative has started, and I cannot think. We, as a church body, should be applauding Rachel Mills and everything that she has done to help get this thing launched. And so, Rachel, from the church, thank you so much for everything that you have done and continue to do to help Beyond Us actually take place. Now, Vacation Bible School, seeing all of the changes, I can't wait for you to experience them. This is what's crazy. It fills me with joy. And this is the entire letter that Paul has been writing to the Church of Philippi is about joy. Now, last week where we left off, it wasn't just joy. It was actually knowing him brings joy. In fact, Philippians chapter three, verse 10, it actually says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. It's where we left off last week. This week, I'm actually going to give you the end before I jump in. We're going to end in verse 20. And in verse 20, it actually says this, but our citizenship is in heaven and from it, we await a savior, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Await a savior. Now, what's fascinating about this is this has been my world for the past eight to nine weeks. I'm asked two questions every single day. Number one, when is the church opening back up? First and foremost, the church never closed. Our building, but the church, you cannot close the church. Number two, second question I'm asked is, is COVID-19, coronavirus, is it a sign of the end times? Fascinatingly enough, since Paul is pointing us, awaiting for the Lord, he's actually talking about waiting for a savior. He's giving us this insight. The savior's come. We know this, the first advent when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, lived a sinless life, went to Calvary's cross. And now Paul is pointing the church to the second advent, the second coming of Jesus. He's pointing them to the end. And so since the question comes up, is this a sign of the end times? Paul in Philippians, right where we're at, is pointing us to the end times. I thought, Let's deal with it. So I'm gonna give you a response, okay? Jesus is asked a question by his disciples and I'm gonna break it up into two parts. I'm gonna sandwich the two-part answer Jesus gives about the end times with our text from Philippians. So let me start with the question that many have asked me, is this a sign of the end times? It's the same question the disciples ask Jesus. Here we go. Matthew chapter 24, I'm gonna pick up reading right here and it says this to us, it says, As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples, they came to him privately. And they said to him, ask him this question. They said, tell us, when will these things be? Referencing the end times. And what will the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now, this we've done, we've, through dispensationalists, we've actually taken this and turned it into three questions. There's actually only two questions here, if you put it in a context. The first question is, when will these things be? Jesus, when will the end come? What is it gonna look like? And then the second question there is, what are the signs that the end is here? What is the signs that you are coming? And so Jesus answers this really in two parts. So let's deal with the first part first, okay? The first part he's gonna deal with is, what will the sign of your coming in the end of the age be? So Jesus answered them in verse four, and he said this. He says, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And listen to this, and you will hear of wars, Check, rumors of wars, check. See that you are not alarmed for this must take place, but the end is not yet. He continues and he says, for nation will rise against nation. If you're keeping track, check. Kingdom against kingdom, check. And there will be famines, check. And earthquakes in various places, check. In Luke chapter 21, verse 11, Jesus is answering the same question and he adds the word Luke, the physician, says he says pestilence, diseases of all sorts and all kinds. When these things happen, you will know that the end is near. Jesus says, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. So the disciples ask the same question that I'm hearing. Is this a sign of the end? How will we know when the end is going to be? And Jesus answers them in two parts. This first part, He was very clear and very distinct to actually point them to say, hey, there are going to be these signs. So let's talk about the the birth pains part. 
okay? Because I, I wanna bring everything into context and for me to land the plane where we're gonna land it, you've actually gotta see this part in context as well. And so when he talks about this idea of the end and Jesus coming, all right, in the church period, which is where Philippians would have been written, it would be the church age. We are in the church age, okay? So dispensationalists are gonna actually put periods of time together. And so this is what it would have looked like for 1800 years. Didn't matter if it was Orthodox, if it was Protestant, if it was Catholic. This is what it looked like for 1800 years. This was the timeline, okay? So it was the church age. From the church age, it went into tribulation. And then from the tribulation was the second advent, the second coming of Christ, the end when he came back to take his church, the battle of Armageddon, all of that takes place. And so that was commonplace. And then about 1830, a guy from Ireland by the name of John Darby actually created this word and the word is rapture. He brings it to America. D.L. Moody makes it well known. D.L. Moody, the, it's still DL, the Moody um, Bible Institute up in Chicago makes it very popular theory. Now there's books, there's series, there's all kinds of things. And so 1800 years went by and there wasn't any focus on rapture. The actual church period, tribulation, second advent is the way that they received it. And so it morphed a little bit. Now, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because I want you to hear this. I don't care what your end times, what dispensational viewpoint you may have, there's a promise that lingers. Pre-trib, post-trib, it doesn't matter. The promise is that Jesus is coming. And so Jesus is gonna answer their question very, very clearly. There's like, when is this gonna happen? It's gonna do this, but l- let me get into Philippians because Paul is doing the same thing that Jesus did to the entire church. He's gonna point them to the end. He's gonna help us answer the question, is COVID-19, the coronavirus, is it a sign of the end times. Let's pick up in Philippians. Philippians chapter three, pick up right where Brandon left off last week in verse 12, and it says this. It says, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect. Remember, Paul was talking about his past, who he was, and then he turned his eyes forward and began to share who he was in Christ. He began to share everything about himself. And there were parts of it that Brandon actually said he couldn't understand or wasn't relatable. Well, I assure you that this portion, Brandon would say, is very relatable because he's now looking forward at who he is in Christ. And so he's pushing them down a forward timeline. He says, but I press on to make it my own. He's like, I I move forward because I wanna own. I want this to be what I am, Christ Jesus. He has made me his own. Paul is making a confession saying, I can look forward and I can press forward because I belong to the Lord Jesus. He goes on and he takes the next step. He says in verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I've made it on my own. He's made full confession. Only through Jesus could he actually come alive and be the person that he is today. So he's saying, I haven't done this on my own. This is through God's grace. This is through his son, Jesus, who has reconciled me back to the father. This is Paul giving Jesus glory. He says, but this one thing I do. So I didn't, I'm not responsible for my righteousness. That's Jesus. But Paul says, but here's what I do. So he's now telling the church what he actually does. And he says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Paul gives them insight. And and I want you to understand this because this is something that plagues us as well. This idea of straining forward and not looking behind us, you know, the past, the past bogs us down. The past can just be debilitating for us. And what Paul is wanting them to understand, and he's pointing them towards, he's like, if you're gonna look back, the only thing you should look back at is the cross on Calvary's hill. Beyond that, you have got to have a mindset of moving forward. Luke chapter nine, verse 62, it actually says to us there, it says that no one who puts his hand to a plow and looks backwards is fit for service. And so the idea here is if you are going to look backwards at your past, you are going to let your past dominate, rule, lead you, you're never gonna become who you need to be in Christ because our role is to be straining forward. Well, I'm gonna get to this, but let me go ahead and give you the answer to this, okay? The idea of straining forward, this is us being prepared to stand before a holy and righteous God. This is making sure that we understand that we are not to set our mind on earthly things, but to set our minds on heavenly things. And this is gonna be Paul's entire point here for the next couple of verses. He's gonna give them an understanding of how they actually strain forward. They're looking toward something, not back at something. Looking back is dangerous. 
I went uh, fishing with my daughter, and this is just last week. And while I'm out there fishing, uh, it was getting dark outside, and this uh, snake, it was, uh, it was a black mamba. I'm pretty sure it was the most poisonous snake on earth. And it was swimming through the water, and I saw it. And, and again, I, I just was watching it. She was fascinated by it. I picked up a rock. It was a pretty good-sized rock. I took two steps, a crow hop, and threw the rock, not expecting to hit it. I mean, I, sure, I was trying, but I wasn't expecting to hit it. I nailed this thing, hit it right in the back. It sinks down, and when it comes back up to the surface, its head is working, its tail is working, but the middle of it is completely broken. Now, my daughter looks at me in complete shock, utter disappointment, and she said, Dad, why did you do that? I'm like, don't you turn me into the villain here. That snake, that is Satan's spawn. That is the villain. I'm the hero. She made me, I literally, I felt so guilty. And I told her, I was like, why are you making me feel guilty for saving your life? It's like the snake wasn't doing anybody any harm. That snake, I'm pretty sure, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure it was about to turn around and make its way right to her. I said, I saved your life. Just be thankful that you're still alive right now. You should be thanking me, not making me feel guilty. Well, I was convinced at this point, it's time to go. I had the heebie-jeebies. You ever had the heebie-jeebies? I had the heebie-jeebies. And what, what I mean is like everywhere I looked, like a piece of grass would touch me and I was positive. The snake that was wounded, killed it with my bare hands. Urgh. The snake, I was convinced, he had sent off some sort of bat signal to all of his friends. And so it was dark enough that I'm not comfortable anymore. So, hey, you know, it's time to go. It's time to go. So we start picking up our stuff. And the whole time that I'm walking out, I'm looking backwards because I'm positive there's snakes chasing me down. And as I'm walking backwards, I'm trying to stay on concrete. I step on rock, I twist my ankle. It was the most miserable walk I can tell you I've had in a long time because I was focused so much on what was behind me and I wasn't even paying attention to what was in front of me. You and I do this in life all the time. Paul is telling them, you have got to strain forward. You're gonna stand before a holy and righteous God one day. That should be what you're striving for. Don't let your past failures, don't let your, your past weigh you down. You are alive in Christ, and so walk faithfully after him. Listen to how he says this. Here's how he responds. He says in verse 15, he says, uh, I'm sorry, verse 14, he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Using Olympic language, cultural. We covered that two weeks ago. Verse 15, he says, let those who are mature think this way. So let those that are mature think this way. What way? What way? Forward. It's exactly what he's already said. He's like, let the people that are mature think in a forward process, straining forward, not looking backwards. Why does he want them straining forward? Spoiler alert, because he's pointing them to the end, that they are gonna stand before a holy and righteous God, and he wants them to have their mindset on heavenly things, not earthly things. And so he's telling them, Walk like you're mature, forward. And if any of you think otherwise, so if you think that there's another option, God's gonna reveal to you also that the only way that you're gonna find joy, the only way you're gonna find straining, being successful is if you're walking forward. I, I love the fact that he says in verse 16, only let us hold true to what we have obtained. What's true for you is not the things of the past. What's true for you is what you've attained in Christ. He's like, why don't you focus on Jesus? If I could go back and raise my children all over again, I am positive, completely convinced that I would have spent a majority of my time teaching them how to love like Jesus. Love like Jesus. This would have been the central theme and focus of the way I raised my kids. You know, we spend most of our time disciplining and putting boundaries in. We have to do all those things. But I'm wondering what happens in their life if their only focus was you've obtained Jesus, love like him. Jesus is in you, live like him. Jesus is in you. I mean, I just watched this moment for Paul and I can hear him and I'm thinking, I believe that the forward journey for them, knowing what they've obtained in Christ, if you and I know this, it changes us. Paul says in verse 17, brothers, join me, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk. You know how you walk? He's talking about walking forward. Moonwalk hadn't been invented yet. 
The backwards walk didn't even happen yet, all right? So he's talking about watch those who walk forward. They're straining forward. Walk according to the example you have in us. Walk like we've walked forward, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. For many, listen to this, wow. Verse 18, for many of whom I have told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies. You hear that? They walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. These are people that Paul knew were good people but they were walking as enemies. Paul wrote to the church of Colossae and in Colossians chapter 21, he actually says, or in fact, chapter one, verse 21, he actually says this to them. He says, you were once alienated from God, alienated, enemies because of your evil. This is me. This is you. This is anyone on planet earth who has not been reconciled back to God through faith in Jesus, they are enemies of a holy and righteous God. And Paul was telling them, I say this all the time, we are not all God's children. We are all God's creation. You are not God's child until you come to faith in Christ and then you become a child of God. This is what Paul is pointing them towards. He's saying, I have watched all of these people walk as enemies. They thought they were doing good. They thought they were good enough. They, they were looking at their past and some of the things that they had done that seemed pretty noble. And so they consider themselves a good person and Paul's saying they're not, they're not. They're enemies of God. Paul wanted the church to understand this because he knew, he knew what was in store for them. And he tells us in verse 19, he picks up and he says, their end, their being those who are enemies of God, he says, their end is destruction. Why is their end destruction? Listen to what he does here. He's telling them, this is why it's destroying people who think they're good. They think they're good, they see their noble deeds, they are being destroyed. Why? It says, because their God is their belly. That means that their physical needs, their physical desires drive them. Everything about them is driven by their own physical desires. And Paul's saying, that will destroy you. I, <laughs> I could give thousands of examples of this. And their glory, or they glory in their shame. Their shame is their sin. That is what they're known for. It shines. So they give way to their physical need and then they dwell, live in the muck, the just nastiness of their own sin. That is their glory. They don't know the glory of the Lord. They're an enemy. They only know the depths and the dirtiness of their own sin. He says then to them, he says, and because their minds, here's why all this is happening, because their minds are set on earthly things physical, earthly things. And this is what Paul wants them to know. If your idea and your mindset is soaked in and absorbed in all of the physical things of this world, you are never gonna have your eyes and mind set on heavenly things, things that are above. And so Paul is going to now push them to say, here's how you strained forward. Here's why you strained forward. And here's what we are longing for as people of God. He says, the people that are let their stomachs, their physical desires drive them, that dwell in their own sin, that think and dwell on the earthly things. Listen to what he says to them. He says, that's not you. That's not supposed to be you. It's not supposed to be me. He says in verse 19, I mean, verse 20, he says, our citizenship is in heaven. We don't belong to this world. We belong to a heavenly father. And so our citizenship is in heaven. And so from it, he says, from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has just walked them down this journey, telling them, here's who I was. Jesus has changed me. I walk forward. I strain forward because I know that forward is the day that I'm going to meet face to face with a holy God. I'm going to stand before Jesus one day and I am straining forward. I'm gonna fight through the physical things of my life. I'm not gonna let my sin bog me down and I'm certainly not gonna let this world dictate who I am. I am going to strain forward, overcome the things of this world because when I stand before my savior, my redeemer, I want him to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, Paul has just done what has happened. The disciples said to Jesus, tell us the signs of the end times. Paul is pointing them to the end. You're asking the question, is COVID-19 coronavirus, is this a sign of the end times? Well, let me give you part two of Jesus's response to the disciples. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I'm gonna flip your world a little bit upside down because I need to put this in context. 
okay? Context is, is key here. So Matthew chapter 24, I'm gonna jump down to verse 36. This is where Jesus is still responding to the disciples and he's still giving them. They say, when is this gonna happen? What are the signs? Listen to what Jesus says in verse 24. He says, or in chapter 24, verse 36, he says, but concerning the day and the hour. So they said, when is this gonna happen? Jesus says, no one knows. It's cut and dry. All right, just simple cut and dry. He says, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but the father only. For as it were in the days of Noah, so will it be the coming of the son of man. So Jesus has just said, exactly what happened in the days of Noah is also gonna be what happens when the son of man returns. Now, let's take this in context. I'm not talking about the last couple hundred years after this idea of rapture had been put out there. I'm talking about original church doctrine original, okay? Where we went from church age, tribulation to the second advent. This is the way they would have heard this. Before the Left Behind series comes out, before all that came out, they would have heard every person, man, woman, child that heard this. Here's what they would have heard. Listen carefully. It says in verse 38, for as in the days of Noah, okay? So as this day, ready for this? He says, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them away. So will it be the coming of the son of man. And then he says in verse 40, some famous, famous parts here. I'm gonna flip it. You're gonna have to unlearn something here, okay? Flip it upside down. He says, the two men will be in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. Well, in our mindset, the way that we've grown up and we understand this is, wow, this is part of the rapture. We see this as saying, so there's two men in the field. One is gonna be raptured. The other one's gonna be left standing there going, huh, what happened? But as in the day of Noah, this was actually flipped. So the way Jesus was telling this and the way that the church would have heard it for 1800 years is the righteous were the ones who stayed. Noah and his family were the righteous ones. They stayed, everyone else was taken away. And so it's flipped. He goes on and he says, two women grinding in the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. The same concept. One will be taken and one will be left. Well, in their mind, they're going, whew, the righteous, those who walk with Christ, they're going to be left and the evil, the wicked ones, they're gonna be the ones taken away. Now, I can't get over this next piece because Paul said, await, await eagerly await a savior who is Christ Jesus, the second advent. And Jesus says, and this is his point, and this is his theme, stay awake, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. See, the thing that gets me here, I'm gonna answer the question, okay? Is COVID, is coronavirus, is this a sign of the end times? I'm gonna answer it, but before I answer it, let me make sure that this is, everything's in context here, okay? So we can put this together. Stay awake. He says, await, await, await. The disciples, they asked Jesus, tell us when this is gonna happen and what are the signs? And Jesus landed them on, you know what? You better be ready. Paul, in the letter to the, to the Philippians, his point of saying, await, he's saying, you better be ready. You better be a man or a woman who's straining forward, not dwelling in the past, but straining forward because you know that your day, your time is going to come. You better be ready to stand before a holy and righteous God. This is what Jesus was giving them. This is what Paul was giving them. So if you ask me, is COVID-19 a sign of the end times? By definition, sure, it's a pestilence, it's a disease. But I believe that if you were to come to me and ask that question, here's what I would say to you. If you were to come to Jesus and ask that question, here's what he would say to you. If you were to come to Paul and ask that question, is COVID-19 a sign of the end times? I think this is what Paul would say to you as well. And it would be this. You're asking the wrong question. The promise is the second advent, Jesus is coming. The question isn't, is this a sign that it's about to happen? The question you should be asking, the question I should be asking is, am I ready? 
Are you ready to stand before a holy and righteous God? Have you spent your life straining forward enough that you've allowed the physical things of this world, the things that bring destruction, your physical desires, your physical drives, have you let those things push those aside so you could strain forward and honor a holy and righteous God so that when you stand before him that day and you and I are guaranteed, guaranteed a day that we're gonna stand before God, guaranteed. The question you should be asking is not what are the signs? You should be asking, am I ready? The promise is there. He is coming. He, our savior, our redeemer, he is coming. And he said, I want you to be prepared. Paul said, I I want you to be prepared. This entire idea of straining forward, this is what Paul's heart was. He was saying, don't live in your past. I want you to prepare yourself to stand before God. Be prepared. So this is where I would leave us. And this is what I would hope for every one of us. Because this is a consuming time and everybody likes to focus on the end and what do the end times look like. People love to study the book of Revelation. I really believe that if men and women, you and I, if we would spend our time just making sure that we are prepared, no one knows the day and hour. You can study all you want. You're not gonna have the answer. The only answer we have is in Christ There is an umbrella of grace that rests over us. There is an umbrella that covers our sin, our past, our shame. And so when God looks down on us, there is no condemnation because we are under Christ. And so for us, it is not, is this a sign? For us, the question should be, am I prepared? And the answer to that lies within this. Have you received Jesus as your savior? Now, Paul would say, I know a lot of good people and with tears who would say, yes, I'm a Christian, I go to church. Or yes, I'm a Christian. My parents took me to church. I went to vacation Bible school when I was a kid. Those things do not make you a child of God. The only thing that makes you a child of God is not living in the past of the things that you might have done, is straining forward and asking yourself daily, working out your salvation with fear and trembling daily by asking the question, have I accepted Christ and have I allowed him to be my forward focus? So today, have you accepted Christ? Have you Reach that point in your heart and your life where you say, I am going to do everything in my power to strain forward to make sure that when I stand before him, he says to me, well done, my good and faithful servant. Church, Jesus said, be prepared. Paul says, be prepared. I'm pleading with you. Let's be prepared. God, I pray over my brothers and sisters. I pray over those who are listening to this today that maybe Um, have not entered into a relationship with you, that they would take that step, that they would believe today that there is something better than what this world has to offer and they would receive that. Lord, and that would be your son, Jesus. He is the one who reconciles us back to you, our heavenly father. He is the one who went to the cross for my sin, for our sin. He is the one who takes away my shame. He is the one who offers me life. He is the one that I am preparing and straining forward to meet. And so Lord, that that would be our hearts together today. Let those who need to say yes to Jesus today say yes. And let those who need to strain forward with everything in them, strain forward. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everybody in the house said, amen, amen, and amen. Love you, church. Can't wait to see you. Paul says that our citizenship is in heaven for those who believe in Jesus Christ. And so for us, what that means is, that means that Jesus came to this earth, that he died on the cross for our sins, so that if we place our faith in him, that we can spend eternity with him. And so if you'd like to do that this morning, You can do that by texting the number that you'll see at the bottom. We'd love for you to take just a moment right now and pray and ask the Lord, say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I'm in desperate, desperate need of you. And we believe that in doing that, you'll give your life over to Jesus and that he'll meet you in a powerful, powerful way today. Now, we told you at the beginning of today that we have a very, very important announcement, and here it is. We are so excited to announce that we will be meeting again together in person starting June 7th. Now these will be family services and there's gonna be a limited capacity to all the things that we're doing. And I know that many of you have lots of questions and you're wondering about a lot. Actually on our website, we have our policies, procedures, things that you'll need to know, places where you can RSVP. And our big ask is this, if you're willing to help us open back up, make sure that this is a clean and safe place, please go to that webpage, 
Fill out the volunteer form that's there. We would love to have your help in opening back up. Thank you so much. We hope that you have a blessed week and we can't wait to see you again. Thank you.